lighter movie talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning are all my friends who all <laughs> wanted to come and hang out with me today, <laughs> <laughs> starting with senior producer, John Campia. Hey, greetings, citations, everybody. I flew all the way back from Canada just to hang out with Sinead today. Yay! And uh, we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also, who came here to hang out with me, writer-director John Schnepp. Totally flew in this morning at 5 in the morning from Oakland. He did. To hang out with Sinead and talk about Star Wars and then, oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> let's, not, let's not go there. Also here, who also came to hang out with me today, it's Mark Ellis. I'll be honest, I'm still here from yesterday. I was just hanging out all day. I slept there. I'm not leaving anytime soon. Didn't you soon. do like seven shows last yesterday? I did 17 shows yesterday, all in different costumes. <laughs> He did. He did four costume changes yesterday. It was like a Katy Perry concert. Which is kind of crazy. Yes, it was. And I'm not sure if he came to hang out with me, but I just tell myself that he did. It's Christian Harloff. I didn't. Um, I will say this, that you are in costume still. It looks like you're in Caddyshack 3. <laughs> I don't like all these degenerates in my country club. We're all good on you, though. Hey. Get rid of these nerds. Yeah, we had a full table today, guys. So uh, let's get rolling. The highly anticipated Warner Brothers film, Batman v Superman, is still six months away from hitting theaters oh. on March 25th. <laughs> Ray, Ray strikes Ray again. Ray's the best. On to uh, March 25th, 2016. <laughs> but we now have the film's official rating from the MPAA. I wonder what it is. <laughs> according, according to the association, Batman v Superman will be rated PG-13 for intense sequences of violence and action throughout and some sensuality. Yeah. Fearing the actions of a godlike superhero left unchecked, Gotham City's own formidable forceful vigilante takes on Metropolis's most revered modern-day savior while the world wrestles with what sort of hero it really needs and with batman and superman at war with one another a new threat quickly arises putting mankind in greater danger than it's ever known before john any surprises about the pg-13 rating for batman v superman no no surprises here for a pg-13 rating um i think what is surprising is the reaction i saw online from some people who were shocked why doesn't it get an r rated really? I, could, I honestly i could not i couldn't believe it how many people i number one were surprised it wasn't r-rated or were upset that it didn't get an r rated how come deadpool can get an r rating and batman can't really there yeah. has never been a batman film um, at least not since the second Tim Burton one, because I think the first one was PG. Mm -hmm. There's never been a Batman film that was not PG-13. That's it's PG-13 is what you do. There's no need for Batman to be rated R. There's no precedent for Batman to be rated R. Um, so, no, absolutely no surprise. PG-13 is the right rating for this. I, I got to admit, I would have been a little concerned had it been PG. To understand the type of, you know, the high-octane violence we're expecting to see. And, I mean, look, the trailer alone, that's PG-13 minimum anyway. So, no surprise there. The description about why it got PG-13, though, was interesting. Scenes of sensuality. I, I can, All I can figure is that there must be a scene. Ben Affleck gets out of the shower. He's got his Batman cowl hanging up there. Turns on some music and starts doing a dance rubbing his nipples. <laughs> and that's, that's PG-13. Right or there. Wonder Woman and Batman are getting down. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> well, I another... Yeah, hey, here, where's your magic lasso? Here you go. So I, I don't know. That's, I just, I don't know. Did I just say that? Hey, Christian, any surprise for you? <laughs> that comment. Um, I, I think, you know, yeah, I would have been surprised if it was NC-17 or R right. or, or G. PG-13 <laughs> PG to me is... That's what it's called, Super Friends. Right. PG-13 is what it should be. Like, listen, I am always screaming for rated R movies when it... When it Fits it. Um, I still I understand why Hunger Games is PG-13, but I thought that that particular movie would have benefited from an R. But I understand why it is the same way. Same way, this movie, and because you had Superman in there as well too. But these are two of the more iconic characters in history. We finally get to see them. It would not be fair, even though they would sneak into the movie anyway, to take that away from 13 and 14 year olds that want to see Batman versus Superman. Just putting it towards a mature audience. It doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense for the wallet of the studio. 
So yeah, PG thirteen is a no is a no brainer. Mark, I mean, yeah. Look, my first thought when I heard sensuality wasn't Ben Affleck rubbing his nipples. <laughs> um, I think that there's so many different characters in this movie. It could be something with Wonder Woman making out with somebody. Sensuality can just be like kind of necking. You know, that can be Jesse Eisenberg's left hand. Did he just say necking? Necking. Uh, me and Mandy were necking <laughs> behind. He's the dressed for the fifties right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so this Splish, doesn't surprise splash. me at all. <laughs> this, <laughs> how do I how do I look like the fifties? Hey, yeah. uh, hey. hey. could this not just be breast cancer awareness. This just have to be. Oh, Ellis looks like the fifties. You, you look like the flamingo kid. Yeah, the flamingo. <laughs> where's my pink flamingo <laughs> car? To me, you look more like the villain out of an eighties frat movie. Yeah, That's yeah. what I feel like, and you nerds are ruining my daddy's property. <laughs> where's Preston? <laughs> I'm not su- surprised it's PG thirteen. Snap, Philampo. You're not done uh, waxing my car. <laughs> Going back to the thirties. See, Philampo. Take you my wife. Who you been there? Been hey. <laughs> Um, yeah, PG-13, no, I'm not astonished. I wasn't screaming. Why is it not rated R? It seems natural. The one, yeah, that sensuality, I was like, yeah, are Batman and Superman getting it on? Is that like a secret or something? Or <laughs> They always say some sensuality. It's going to have something to do with Wonder Woman. You're right. Yeah. Though. But it's I'll tell you. Ba- the, it's Bruce Wayne and uh, Princess Diana. Uh, you, like I mean, even, the, even that trailer, there's a couple, when they're, when they're dancing together, too, you, you see the sexual chemistry there. Who knows? Maybe Superman and Wonder Woman. Something. Or... Superman and Lois Lane. I mean, it's right. it's the next step in their relationship. It's time. If I had just seen the trailer and didn't know who Batman was and who Superman was, I might think this movie's rated R because it's very intense. It's very right, gritty. Sure. But it's Batman and Superman, of course, PG-13. <laughs> this isn't real life. There aren't 40 different numbers you can pick. There's four ratings you could possibly, five you could possibly have. And you're gonna go PG-13. I'm just trying to think of a sensual scene of Superman Lois. I can see this scene where says, "I'm really sorry, Lois. This never happens to me. I must have been near Kryptonite sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the and issue." And Batman underneath the bed going, "Hee hee," <laughs> <laughs> with, <laughs> with the Kryptonite. <laughs> but I still, I still, what I, I still have a hard time. And, and honestly, guys, if there's some of you out there who actually thought there was a possibility of an R rating. I, I would love to hear what your thought process is. I would love for you to jump in the comments in your thought process. I just don't like. Do they expect? Superman to punch Batman and yell straight out of Krypton mother effer or <laughs> right, something like right. that. What were they? I just don't know. So please leave us your thoughts. Let us know what made you think this could have been an R-rated film. I'd be curious to know. All right, what's next? Over the last few years, there have been several items of speculation and rumors <laughs> surrounding a possible feature film version of the popular TV series, <laughs> Game of Thrones. Ray is two for two. <laughs> <laughs> now you can add more fuel to that fire as Game of Thrones creator George R.R. R. Martin said the following in a recent interview. There will be a movie, but I will not be involved. I have too much to do. That is something HBO and DB and David are dealing with. I have two more books to finish, and I still have so much to do. The article in the Daily Star also went on to say the following. They are looking at dipping back in times during certain periods of the series, which could be examined as a one-off plot. That means that some of the big characters who fans have seen die on screen could be resurrected. Christian, do you think we'll actually see a Game of Thrones feature film? And if so, how do you think they're going to handle it? Uh, I do think we're going to see a feature film. I think that by them releasing a few of those episodes, I think it was the end of season two or three, whatever, whatever that season was, that they put a few episodes into the theater. In IMAX. In last, IMAX. Last season. Season last season. And the great response that it got. And it's funny because I think it was last Friday... Um, Dennis, myself, and David Griffin were talking about t- TV going to film as a work, and I was actually against a lot of it, but we all mentioned that Game of Thrones would work and could work because of the scale. I actually think that would be great to do what they're talking about here, is to go back a certain event. I don't know how far in time. Maybe they do The Mad King, which is what, 50 years before, whatever, how many mm-hmm. years before, or something on a time period they didn't cover in the show that they wanted to do, and I'm okay with David Benioff doing, doing a version of this, because he's still got George R. R. Martin's phone number. You can still get notes and figure out stuff of that nature. I think that this is a property that lends itself to the big screen. I think it would do really well. I think it's an epic movie that could come out in the summer. I think it's an epic movie that com- could come out in December. It's it it serves that fantasy niche that we that we want, and it might be able to introduce fans um, of the t- who've never seen a TV show to just see in, they're sitting in a movie and they see the trailer for Game of Thrones and like oh, okay I've heard of the TV show and they go and they see the movie it blows them away and then they revisit and watch the whole series. I think it's really smart. 
Mark? As the heir to the AMC fortune, <laughs> this is great news. I think this is definitely going to happen, and sooner rather than later. And what George R. R. Martin is talking about doesn't seem all that dissimilar from the transition that George Lucas made with his baby Star Wars, where eventually you hand off your property because it becomes more than just about you. It's a very valuable property, and they're going to want to make a lot of movies based on this. This is great news because finally we're going to get to see Sean Bean survive a movie. <laughs> Maybe, <right? laughs> you know his head's going to be yeah. intact by the end of this thing. It's exciting. This is smart. It's the right business move. I think they'll obviously wait until after the <clears throat> series runs its course before you release a movie in the theaters, but you're right, just based on the success alone of them releasing an IMAX, this is a no-brainer. I just heard thousands of voices scream out in <laughs> anger of people who have not watched season one. <laughs> 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 season one. I mean, this this show has always been one that is shot very cinematically. It's a very cinematic um, on TV show it's shot the way and I'll be honest as much as I really love the show one of my criticisms of Game of Thrones has been a lot of the episodes have pacing problems sometimes because in you know one episode will have three amazing scenes that make the whole episode worth it but in between those three amazing scenes can be just be time filler and it would be kind of cool to see a two hour and 20 minute movie that's you know all thriller no no filler and like all the way through and that would be kind of interesting. Plus, while I'm normally against prequel ideas, there's a lot of time periods that you could go back to the, you know, uh, the Stark and Baratheon rebellion against the Mad King. You could totally go back and tell that story. You can go back even further to when the Dragon Wars happened. You, there's lots of different things you could do here. So, and it wouldn't interfere with the show if you go back 50 or 100 or 1,000 years. Then it doesn't interfere, interfere with the show at all. So there's a lot of possibilities here. Schnapp, what do you think? I would like to see the movie happen before the actual Game of Thrones series is over, and it would be great to bring back Sean Bean and cover some of that. So it's not so far away. It's not like a thousand years beforehand. Right. So it still has some kind of bearing on what's happening now. I'm excited to see a Game of Thrones movie. And and from what I hear, I'm not reading the books myself, but from what I hear is that this past season already took a lot of liberties with the storylines yeah. that were in George R. R. Martin's books. So they already have a creative team that is taking their own path with this, so it makes sense to do more projects. It would be cool as well to see uh, um, Jamie Lannister take out the Mad King mm -hmm. as well, too. That'd be something interesting. Yeah. And then it'd be also great to see George R. R. Martin in the Willow sequel. <laughs> 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 All right, folks, reach that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? The original Disney hit film Enchanted hit theaters back in 2007. And while there have been rumblings of a possible sequel for years, no discernible movement has ever taken place. However, according to our own Collider.com, there may actually be legitimate life in those plans. According to the new report, Disney is now moving forward with the sequel, which has the working title of Disenchanted. The <laughs> proposal, Hot Pursuit, and the guilt trip director Anne Fletcher is attached to helm the film with no official word yet on who, if any one from the original cast will return. The original film starred Amy Adams, James Marsden, Patrick Dempsey, and Susan Sarandon and made over $340 million at the box office. Mark, buy or sell that we'll actually see an Enchanted sequel. I buy everything about this. I would totally sell the fact that the Hot Pursuit director is doing it. Yeah. But other than that, yeah, this, this, this makes so much sense. I've never seen Enchanted. Gasp. People love this movie. They celebrate this movie for whatever reason. They get swept up in a world of imagination with this thing. They can't stop talking about it. So to I'm surprised we haven't seen a sequel yet. We're definitely going to see one soon. Yeah, this is Enchanted was for me one of those movies that I was not expecting anything out of whatsoever and went into went, wow, that was entertaining. And Amy Adams can sing and all this kind of stuff. Patrick Dempsey, by the way, I always keep saying this, was my number one choice to play Doctor Strange, actually. And since he got killed off of that, uh, whatever that TV show he's in, spoiler alert, um, then I, the schedule's kind of wide open. James Marsden is not doing nearly as much as he should be doing because that dude's a phenomenal actor. So, yeah, I'm all for this. I believe we're going to see all the, well, at least a good number of the original cast back. And I love the title, Disenfran uh, Disenchanted. Disenfranchised. Disenfranchised. Disenfranchised is going. <laughs> Anne Fletcher is interesting. She did, she directed the proposal which I thought was hilarious. I love that movie. I thought the story was well told, beautifully paced, great humor in it. Betty White is fantastic, of course. And then the guilt trip. And then Hot Pursuit. So good. Oh, wait, <laughs> so no, no, good. No, 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 sorry. I was looking for the word terrible, terrible. Um, 
Yeah, so that kind of has me a little bit concerned. Like, which which Fletch are we going to get? Are we going to get the proposal one, or are we going to get the guilt trip one? I mean, I, and I'm, I, I'm blaming Ann Fletcher for Hot Pursuit. There's a lot of problems with that movie. The least of which I think might be the person behind the camera. That movie was terrible. From it was a doomed project from the start for me. But I, you know, the proposal is what I'll go into this movie thinking. Schnepp? I'm disinterested in this uh, <laughs> sequel. I didn't. Mean, I like Mark did not see Enchanted. Just wasn't calling to me when it was out there. Well, we should do it together. Yeah, let's see it together, man. But wear that pink shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's a date. We'll see it together. Um, and then we'll talk about our feelings about the sequel, Disenchanted. Yeah, so I sell it. Uh, I buy it, and I think that, well, I buy it because the first one, wh like you guys said, was a surprise. And But the reason I buy it for the most is because Disney is really paying attention to live-action fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And even though this doesn't come from a, a classic animation, it does come from a property that, and one of their successful. homegrown properties, Absolutely. too, that they developed themselves. And what they did was they spoofed their own movies in a, in a, in a respectful way. Um, in the first, the, the way that, I mean, Amy Adams really put together, I mean, you believe she was straight out of an animation oh, from the 50s. She was yeah. great. Fletcher does make me nervous, though, because she didn't direct the first one. And I do blame her for Hot Pursuit. Uh, I blame anyone involved in Hot Pursuit. And I also blame the fact that. The, I mean, not blame, but the first movie, Hot Pursuit, had a lot to do with the directing. Um, it because you it's it's about a visual style, about making you believe that that animation goes into this live action. It's almost like a Roger Rabbit type thing in a certain way, not not to the extent, but you've got to believe it. And I think the director had a lot to do. Performances and the musical numbers were great, but those musical numbers were directed, I don't believe, by Fletcher. Um, so that might hurt. But as far as buying, I do buy it's going to happen. Yeah, I do too. All right, what's next? What was widely reported earlier has now been made official. Universal Pictures has indefinitely postponed the planned Pacific Rim sequel. Originally slated for release on August 4th, 2017, the spot has now been given to Pitch Perfect 3 instead. Universal put out the following statement. Legendary's Pacific Rim 2, originally scheduled for release on August 4th, 2017, will be redated at a later time. The filmmakers, Legendary and Universal Pictures, are committed to having Pacific Rim 2, the sequel to 2013's Pacific Rim, which generated more than $411 million at the global box office, be the vanguard, fully immersive experience that the franchise deserves. To this end, the decision was made to delay the production and release of Pacific Rim so that the creative team can continue in its efforts to exceed the amazing experience of the first film. John, do you buy or sell that we will actually see a Pacific Rim 2? Say Pacific again. Pacific. It sounded like she said specific. Specific. The specific the Rim that we're dealing specific. with here. Mm -hmm. um, I actually sell it. I, I, I actually don't think it's going to happen. And, you know, when I read this, what kind of screams out to me is... Um, Pitch Perfect 3 is a more important film to Universal than Pacific Rim is. Like, and look, there's also a lot of rumblings going on right now about some beef between Universal and Legendary. We, we, we think there's some animosity going on up there. Maybe this is that. This whole notion, though, this has become this notion of, oh, we want to give them the time to do it. That sounds a lot like when an actor leaves for you no other reason says, oh, yeah, scheduling issues, right. whatever. I'm sorry. And as much, as, as much fun as I had with Pacific Rim... That script could be written over lunch. I mean, let's face it, the strength of Pacific Rim, which I liked. Brunch. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe an elongated brunch. The strength of that film was not the dialogue and was not the script. You could write that thing in a day, no problem. Giant robots, giant monsters, go. Mm -hmm. I don't buy for a second that from when they finished Rolling Camera, from when the, the film came out in theaters in 2013, you know 2017, that's not enough time to really do Pacific Rim mm. to just... No, yes, it is. It's plenty of time. So I don't know what the real stuff going on behind the, the curtains is. I mean, I'm speculating, but the, the fact of the matter is we just don't know what the real issue is. But I do not buy at all this notion of, oh, no, we just need to give the filmmakers you know, proper time to put the... No, no, it's not. So I, I'm i still going to go with... I, I mean, I'm going to die of shock if a sequel comes, but I'm still going to go with The Cell. I don't think this movie's going to happen, Schnapp. I unfortunately agree with you, Cell the idea that this movie will happen especially with these remarks these are those remarks that you do do here constantly it's a cover 
Mm. It's not a real. It's like where well, we want to give the, the give them the time to creatively, expressively. No, 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 <laughs> no. Because they had all these. I mean, not only did they have the Pacific Rim two movie in the works, they also had an entire animated series. So by them putting this off, you know they're putting off the animated series. They wouldn't just invest all this time and money into an animated series without it was supposed to be a build up to the actual release of the film. So I think the King Kong Skull Island Godzilla thing with Legendary pulling away from Universal has actually created some animosity and then they're like, well fine, we're gonna dump this. So it feels like that's what's happening. Christian? I buy it. I think that um, what I, I agree with everything you guys are saying, but I think it's a strategy as far, and I do think that King Kong and Godzilla are gonna crush. And I think because of that, they're gonna go, we need a monster movie, we need one, we, and then Oh, we still have Pacific Rim 2, ready to go. And once they see how it does, mm. now look, if Godzilla and King Kong bomb, which I can't imagine they do, then this movie definitely won't happen. But I think that because monster movie, monster movie, let's have, maybe they can tie it in somehow, put some together some deal, probably not. But I think also, it's also a matter of how um, a Crimson Peak uh, does. And with, with Del Toro, if Del Toro... Because right now you'd assume they want to keep him happy, and and I from what I'm hearing is that this movie Crimson Peak is more romantic, gothic than it is a horror film. Right. And I think people may or may not be disappointed if they don't know that going in. I haven't seen it yet. Remember, but. we've also heard reports coming out that's, that some people at university are calling it a problem film. Right. Which I mean, I, I don't know. Remember, that's rumor. We don't have. We don't know yet. We haven't yeah. seen it or anything too. But it, it's especially if it is this romantic gothic movie and not a horror film because they're selling it in the trailer as a horror it's film. Sold as a horror film, so that could that might hurt del toro's stock um and because right now he wants this to happen this is he loves this property and you there's really no one else you want to see do it but him because he knows but you're right you want to see this only reason you see pacific rim for the first one the second one is to watch big robots fighting big monsters let me throw a ridiculous before we get to mark's answer on this let me throw out a ridiculous scenario here okay this pacific rim 2 right now is on you know indefinite hiatus all right we just saw Universal let another legendary property in Kong, Skull Island, go over to Warner Brothers. What if, with this delay, what if Universal releases Pacific Rim? And it also goes over to Warner Brothers. And now you get this dream giant monster orgy fest Pacific Rim versus King Kong versus Godzilla. Is that even something that, that is that's too the awesome? Remote? But that's what, I, that I, well, that's what I was awesome. saying in the beginning is yeah. the fact that like to watch to see how they play out. And maybe there's another deal that they put together that, to go over that, to another. that all three of them go there because they had this relationship. But I think it's a matter of to see how those first two. But that's that's kind of my point is that if if the movie is if those two other two movies do well and they can come together some deal and then make Pacific Rim 2 more attractive by putting it in that universe, it's possible. That really is all I've ever wanted out of life, is to see all of them <laughs> fight each other, but that's why I'm going to sell that idea, is I think you might see the Kaiju and the Eggers back on screen again. I don't think it's going to be a Pacific Rim 2. I, and So you might get a Pacific Rim 2 way down the road if the Pacific Rim monsters make an appearance in another monster movie that's already successful. You might see it way down the road. I just don't see it happening the crimson peak thing scares me a little bit because i do think they think it's a problem film because it's being marketed as one thing and it's going to actually end up being something else so some people might leave disappointed that they weren't more scared the bottom line is that it's dollars and cents and that pitch perfect two or pitch perfect three makes a lot more sense because the profit margin is so high and the risk is so low that that makes me and the other one percenters very happy all right, folks. Well, listen, it's Wednesday, which means it's time for us to do a little bit of Feeling Old with Rewind, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Every week, we look at the films that are celebrating birthdays this particular week, the 10-year anniversaries and the 20 years anniversaries. Let's start off Feeling Old by talking about the films that turned 10 years old this week. And we start with this turning 10. We've got The Greatest Game Ever Played. The Paul Walker, Jessica Alba classic, <laughs> Into the Blue, and Serenity. Turning 20 years old this week, we've got The Big Green, of course, with the Sandlots, uh, Patrick Renna, and Steve Gutenberg is in there from Police Academy fame. Yes. <laughs> we've got the Denzel Washington film, Devil in a Blue Dress, 
And we've got Halloween, The Curse of Nobody Remembers This Film. Oh, The Curse <laughs> of Michael Myers. So, Christian, let's go down and start with you. The films that are celebrating anniversaries this week. Which ones stand out to you? Um, I remember seeing The Devil in the Blue Dress and liking it. I'm sure if I watch it now, it would be a little dated. But I remember just being in awe mm-hmm. of Denzel Washington, even back then, 20 years ago, whatever it was. Um, but I think out of the t- 10 years... It's great. I remember when, you know, just two things that you guys are all going to yell at me for. The first is how, as far as 10 years ago, remembering when Serenity came out, I've still never seen Serenity. Mm, I watched, really? I watched the first 15 minutes of it. I've just never been, I'm not the biggest Joss Whedon fan sometimes with, with particular writing and how he blends it in with sci fi. But I, I want to go back and revisit because everybody yells at me that I need to go back and watch Did it. Did you watch and, Firefly? No, I just, okay. I just. There's just something I, I I know how many people love Joss Whedon and stuff with Buffy and everything too. I just his writing style sometimes to me just it feels a little cheesy here and there. But um uh, and and but that but that particular movie I want to go and revisit because of John you raving about Edge of Four as being one of the best villains mm-hmm. of all time. I want to go yeah. back. Um the other the other movie. Um, on there into the blue. I can't believe this is the one that I've actually seen. I think all the way through. It's horrible. It's, it's so, so bad. It's so bad, but it's still Jessica Alba looks so good in it. So it's it's worth the watch there. Oh no, denying that, Mark. Yeah, into the blue came on like a week ago, and I might have watched ten or fifteen minutes of it. Um, and that's all I really have to say about any of these movies because these are the <laughs> reason why September is not a great time for movies yet. And this is clear 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that we're not quite at Oscar season, but thankfully this September in 2015, we've already gotten some good movies that are better than the crops that we had this past year. I saw The Big Green and the the Halloween, the, the, the return or the curse of whatever Michael Myers was marking Donald Pleasance coming back to the franchise and some dude named Paul Rudd pops up with that movie as well. <laughs> and I think that might have been, he was filming that and Clue was around the mm-hmm. same time and his agent, I think, had told him that he needs to do the Halloween movie because that's the built-in property and Clueless is kind of a risk and we saw how those two movies turned out. Yeah, for me, uh, Serenity is is the, the film here. I saw Serenity having not seen Firefly wow. at the time. But, it, you know, hey, it was a sci-fi movie, sure. whatever, I'll go see it, whatever. And as somebody who had never seen Firefly, I this is part of the genius of the movie. I was I was not lost at all. I sat down, I watched, it set it up perfectly. I watched it. And I remember at the time, now this is 10 years ago, I said, that is the best sci-fi movie I've seen in years. And to this day, I still think it's it's probably one of the top five or six sci-fi films of the past 10 years since it came out. It is so wonderfully done. The humor is fantastic. You have an incredible villain, a menacing, incredible villain. Surprisingly great space action sequences yep. that you did that I was not expecting at all. Um, and this is what turned me on to then go back and watch Firefly, and it kind of made me appreciate uh, appreciate all the war. And it is it is the film that introduced me to Chiwetel Ejiofor. And ever since I saw this film, I have been singing Chiwetel Ejiofor. Watch out for this guy when he gets the opportunity. He is going to rule this town. And it's, it took seven or eight or nine years, but it's finally starting to happen now. So yeah, Serenity is absolutely the one that stands out to me. Yeah, are you a brown coat now? Uh, no, I'm not a brown coat per se, but I, I am a big fan of the show. Right. So, I mean, I, I had watched Firefly and then, you know, they canceled it and then it took many years to do Serenity. But I agree with you. Like, it's, you didn't have to see those 10 episodes of Firefly to appreciate Serenity as a cool it science helps. fiction film. It helps. But it definitely adds to it. Yeah. Like, so when you when you went back, you're like, oh, okay, these characters, and you see, like, why they're in the film. So definitely see Firefly first, then see you Serenity. You Firefly first? Yeah, you'll appreciate yeah, Serenity yeah, if you more. Can. Yeah, if you can. Is it on Netflix? Yes, uh, yep. it is. Yeah, you can yes. see all of them, and, and believe me, I was just actually talking with Dennis, strangely enough, about Firefly this morning. I was like, I'm going to do four episodes, four episodes, two episodes of the movie. Do like a three night, kind of just jam through them again. Right, I, I do want a few years. I do want to try because I, I mean, people rave about it. Yeah, it's so much fun. It really is. Yeah, I've but never seen it either. So we have our homework this week. The funniest yeah. line in in I think all of Firefly, and only those of you who have seen Firefly will get this. I'll be in my bunk. That if if you know the scene, that movie that that line kills me every single time. Thanks for ruining it. <laughs> yeah. don't, well, you don't know the context. Uh-huh. Wait, wait till you see it. I was gonna mention the the film that strikes me the best is Devil in a Blue Dress, and that's really really worth seeing. If you haven't, if you saw it many years ago, I I see it like once every four years or five years. Yeah, I've really seen it like four it. times, yeah. so it's a great film. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Sinead, what's in the mailbag today? 
Tomas writes, I still haven't seen any trailer for the new Ben-Hur remake. It's not that far off until its release. Is this something to be concerned about? No, absolutely not. I'm very curious. Well, I'm concerned they're doing a Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur to me is one of the greatest motion pictures ever made. But uh, they, they have Jack Houston playing it. I can't remember. There was, a, there was a little bit of a carousel of guys who were going to be playing this iconic role. Uh, but Jack Houston from Boardwalk Empire fame, and so he's got several other things coming out. Uh, he's going to be in it. We've we touch on this every once in a while. The movie is still five months away. It's five months away, right. and while it is an extreme example, remember the first trailer for John Wick dropped about twenty eight days before the movie came out. So I mean, and that's that's unusual too. That's a little short, but and look how that turned out. It was just fine. Five months out and no trailer is nothing to be concerned about. I think eight more weeks pass. And we don't have anything. Once we get into that three-month window, if we don't see anything, then I'm going to start to wonder a little bit. But at this point, I don't think there's anything to be concerned about I, other than the fact that I'm a little bit concerned that they're trying to do Ben-Hur. But let, let's see how that turns out. Anyway, Christian, what do you think? I actually, I, I don't think there's anything to be concerned about either. But I am actually looking forward to Ben-Hur. I want to see um, what the, is John Hus, uh, Houston. Jack Houston. Jack, Jack, Houston, Houston, Jack yeah. Houston as well in the movie. And I think this could be a movie for him really, really where he... Not unlike what you were saying before with Edge of Four, I think this could be one of those roles because he's another one of those guys you recognize him, you recognize him, but he hasn't had that role yet to go that guy. And I think this might be. But how much will people? It gives him a chance to come out from behind that mask. And how many people right, really right. recognize That's what I mean, that absolutely. Mask. Yeah. So and, and but the reverse of that is if you bomb Ben Hur, you're in trouble. Yeah, um, not, not much else to go. But I don't think it's and and I also think it's a it's a matter of strategy and marketing as well too. You don't want it to get lost in certain movies because, like you said, it doesn't come out for five six months from now. You put a trailer out today or tomorrow, people talk about it for a little bit, and then it's gone because in a week, two weeks, you get Star Wars or you get something else right. that comes out, and people aren't talking about the Ben Hur trailer anymore. Right. But if you release it in January when nothing's out, more people are talking about your trailer than they are the, the actual building releases. that momentum to your movie's yeah. release. Yeah, I think you actually get it around the holidays because so many people are at the movies to go see holiday yeah. movies. Yeah. Like you yeah. might get it attached to Star Wars or Bond or something that's right. big like that because that's when they want to start ramping it up. You're right. It's just a matter of how the seasons fall. I think more than how the studio feels about the quality of the movie. I'm cautiously optimistic. I like Jack Houston a lot, but Ben Hur is a that's a tall order to fill, oh, especially yeah. the movie. It's not a summer movie. It's not an award movie. It's kind of it, it's coming out in a little bit of that dead zone. And so that's what concerns me more than anything. I'm sure. excited to see what they do with the trailer because I think they're going to concentrate on the on the actual chariot race. They're going to, I think yeah. they're going to try to up that game and and blow up the original one out of the water. It's going to be a pod do. race in the new one. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully Anakin's not in there with the two headed guys. Oh, no. Like, hey, Yippee! what's happening with Ben Hur? <laughs> yeah. Oh, kill me. All right, what's next? Dylan writes, hey guys, my question is as follows. Who do you think should be nominated for an Oscar for Best Actor or Actress so far this year? Thanks and keep up the great work. It's actually a very interesting question because we're not really, we haven't gotten into the meat of the Oscar films yet that are coming out. And it is important to note, when I go and visit all the award prognostication sites right now, all the people that are listing both in directors and actors and actresses, supporting actors, all of them are from films that have not come out yet. <laughs> but it, it's an interesting question. So if we were to ask today, who are the names that would stand out to me? I'll lead this one off. To me today, if I had to hand out an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress today, Kate Blanchett from Cinderella. I thought she owned that movie. Every And she was the great definition of a supporting actress. She elevates that movie when she's in it. I totally bought it. She brought a new twist to The Wicked Stepmother that... I don't, we haven't really seen before or considered before, yet still being incredibly devious and evil. She was awesome in that. And I think because it was like a light family fair, I think she's going to get overlooked a lot. But even when Oscar season comes, I'm going to think, I'm going to make arguments that you got to consider Kate Blanchett from Cinderella. Um, two names that I would have up there for best actor right now. One is Johnny Depp for Black Mass. Mm -hmm. um, even people who are not completely enamored with the film we're walking out going wow Johnny Depp I mean it's, it's we're actually seeing him return to form which is really great to see the other name Jason Mitchell who played Easy E in Straight Outta Compton mm -hmm. now I don't think Jason's name is going to be there come Oscar time but if we had to give out Oscars today I honestly think two of my front runners are Johnny Depp and and Mitchell because you know he just he completely nailed it best supporting actor 
it's, it's an easy one. It's a walkway, and this will be a name that, that's going to be there come Oscar time. It's Joel Edgerton from Black Mass. Joel Edgerton, uh, as great as Johnny Depp was, Joel Edgerton almost steals that movie, I felt, with his performance as well. So those are the names right now. So for supporting actress Kate, uh, Kate Blanchett for Cinderella. For two names I'll consider for lead actor would be Johnny Depp for Black Mass and Jason Mitchell for Straight Outta Compton. And my best supporting actor would be uh, Joel Edgerton from Black Mass. Christian, what about you? I have a few names on there. No, the only reason that this name is going to be on there is because I'm going to act like I'm in the Academy and I'm just going like this. And no, I haven't seen the movie, but Meryl Streep for Ricky and the Flash. Oh, uh, oh, sorry, and Ricky and the Flash for best for best actress. That's that's another one I totally would. You know, she's a lot of people man. won't like that movie, and a lot of people don't like that movie. But even people who did not like that movie go. I mean, when you look at what she did in that film, yeah, and it's the street it, monster. She she she, she literally. Uh, it's just like holy crap! She she taught herself to play guitar and yeah. sing in that movie. She'll get nom- she'll get nominated for. It. But look, here's the other thing too: is that I don't and like you said in the beginning of this segment here is that we haven't seen all the movies of the people that are going to get nominated. I mean, you still have yeah, this Eddie, is so far. Eddie Redmayne so far. hasn't had his performance yet. We haven't seen it yet. Um, there's a lot of things like Tom Hardy. I haven't seen in Legend yet. I haven't seen all of these things. So. As of today, some of the ones that I would put up there as far as nominations, I'm not going to go as far as to say winners. Um, Andrew Garfield for 99 Homes. Mm. Um, even I wouldn't be surprised if Joseph Gordon-Levitt got something right now. I'd put him in the running if it was today for um, for the walk. The walk. Thank you, um, Josh Brolin. Actually, for Everest, I thought Josh Brolin was incredible in Everest. I think that Benicio del Toro would get should get something for Sicario. Uh, Helen Mirren for Woman in Gold. Tobey Maguire, Pawn Sacrifice. Uh, Alicia Vic- Vikander for uh, um, to Ex Machina. thank you, thank you. Ex Machina, Black Mass, Johnny Depp, Gyllenhaal for Southpaw, Joel Edgerton for The Gift, um, Meryl Streep for Ricky and whatever, and then uh, <laughs> and then whatever. Jason Mitchell for a comp. Oh, and I forgot one name. I should put it, it, the film's not out yet, but since I've seen it, uh, Matt Damon, big surprise to me. Oh in yes, the Matt Damon the Martian. Yes. Matt Damon the Martian, big surprise to me. What about you, Mark? Yeah, I throw uh, Brolin and Blunt from Sicario in there as well. I didn't love the movie as much as some other people at this table. I liked it a lot, but those performances were magnificent. I'd also throw Donald Gleason and uh, Oscar Isaac from Ex Machina in there too. Jason Mitchell was a name that I was going to throw out there as well. Would that not be? I know that Easy was was one of the driving forces of the group, and in the movie, it's such a triumvirate of guys. It really is that is. a supporting role? or would that be best lead actor? I think it's a situation where you had multiple people that could be considered lead actor. Remember, there have been films in Oscar history that had three actors from the same movie all be nominated for best lead right. actor. So I think I, I certainly don't think Easy was a supporting actor, but you can make an argument that there were two or possibly three lead performances, but I would still put him in the lead and performance it's, category. And it's his story. It really, it really it's, is. It's his yeah. story. More so than anybody, than yeah. either the, the other The movie two starts guys. Yeah. with him, yeah. and... Despite the fact that he dies in the movie, I mean, that's to me that's where the momentum of the movie ended. Spoiler: so it, In many yeah. ways, it, it ended with him too. So it's really. But his I, thing. I'd also say, like I've seen maybe two and a half total minutes now of The Revenant. DiCaprio is winning the award for best actor. There's no <laughs> question. Right. Like, he is um, winning the statue. Unless Hardy. unless Hardy steals it from right. him for The Revenant. But like since those movies aren't out yet, I'm going to say lead actress Charlize Theron from Fury Road. I thought she was fantastic nice. in that movie. Nicely done. Um, and I would also say Jason Bateman for The Gift. For The Gift. I mean, that movie just blew me away. I had no, like, I was like, all right, everyone's telling me it's good. And it just, it was shockingly good. And it's, so those are my two. And I agree with everybody else. You guys already got all the rest of them. So, yeah. All right, what's next? Alejandro writes, hey, Collider crew. My question is, with Ghostbusters coming out soon and the recent Fantastic Four movie being remade, and now with news that a new Goonies movie may be remade, why doesn't Hollywood focus on making original movies? I am getting so sick of movies being remade because I want to see something new and original. Kind of glad to hear that the Crow production has been halted. Hmm. I know you guys welcome remakes, but at what point will it be enough? Thanks. Well, I mean, this is because this is a question that comes up so often, Often, like every three months or so, we'll address it. Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, because remember, the movie making business is a business, and when you can, st- for, and making any movie is a roll of the dice, it's a risk. And when you can get a leg up right off the bat, like, hey, you know what? People know the Ghostbusters name. They have an attachment to Ghostbusters. This gives us a big advantage from a start. We're starting on, on square four instead of square one mm-hmm. to make it. That's one of the reasons we get a lot of these remakes and sequels and things like that because you know, you're, the potential for making money is higher there because the audience sees it and knows it, recognizes it, and has an attachment to it. So that's the one thing. However, and I can never emphasize this enough, it is a complete misnomer to say 
there's no original films today. There are, the fact of the matter is, there has never been a period in history when more original films have been produced than there are today. It's also a fact to say there's never been a period in history when more remakes and sequels have also been made, but that's because the overarching fact is there's never been a period in history where more feature films in general have been made. And as a result, there are more original films made today than any other time in Hollywood history. Part of the problem is you don't go see them. I mean, we, we hear people say all the time, oh, there's more original films. And then I will do this almost every time, like three or four times in the past couple of years. I'll run down, well, here's a list of all the movies that opened in the last two months. And like 80% of them will be original films, but none of you went to go see them. So we can say we want original films, and when they come out, the average film goer doesn't rush out to see them. And then we sit back and we complain, why aren't there more original films? Well, there are. They're there. Just look at the lineup. But it's like the fly on the wedding cake. You put a fly, a black fly on a white wedding cake, and you look at it and you say, what do you see? You say you see the fly, when really there's a giant white wedding cake. A lot of these movies are high profile, a Ghostbusters, a Goonies. So those are the ones we get, get the attention, but then when all these like unique original, Sicario coming out, The Walk is not a remake of any kind. Um, the Martian is not a remake or a sequel. I mean, just look at that thing right there. Look over here. Uh, the Intern is not a remake or a sequel. Scorch Trial sequel? Tell Transformation 2 sequel. Two out of the six films. Two out of the six are on our boards. That's just right now. So I, we're not in a situation where Hollywood isn't making original films. They really, really are. Anyway, Schnepp, how, how do you see this whole situation? I agree with you. I mean, the only things that piss me off is when I hear about Monopoly, the movie, or Pez, the movie. That's when I'm like, come on. And that's what you're talking about. There's a branding that people are like, hey, that, that's something that has already been associated in people's minds. Maybe it hasn't been made into a movie yet. I don't see why they're trying, but I get why they're trying. Uh, sequels, it doesn't bother me. Re reboots and remakes, they don't bother me because that happens all the time, and that's how it's always been since Hollywood films have been being made. And it just it's only we're more uh, cognizant of it now because back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and even 60s, there was no such thing as the internet or VHS tapes or being able to re-watch a film. You would have one generation, they saw Miracle on 34th Street, and then 10, 15 years later, they'd remake that movie and release it again. And 15 years later, they'd remake that movie and release it again because there was no, not we're even We're working television. on a remake right now. Right now, uh, we're doing yeah, Miracle on 39th Street. It's, like, it's gonna be crazy. There's ghosts involved. Aunt May shows up. It's gonna be nuts. Spicy Larry's in there, but only for five minutes. Oh, he, he so, dropped. He dropped out. Oh, did he drop out? He, dropped out. Oh, he claims scheduling conflict. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. what they always say. He's shooting Ghostbusters. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Ghostbusters four. Yeah. Christian, um, I yeah, I, I think that, and I although I admire it, I think that this thing of there's no more. There's, there's, there's too many reboots and there's no original material. I think it's kind of an activist position right now of, of, of film fans, and you hear it all the time. I think what it is is that, especially something like Ghostbusters, it's a beloved property, so you hear about it a lot. It's a big story, especially if you're a movie fan and you're following shows like ours and just movie news in general. The big stories are movies, uh, the reboots, and because of, they've come from a beloved property. So those stories are like the front, or like the headlines. A, a movie like Sicario is there when you look for it and you have to really search for it, mm. but it's there. American Ultra, movie no one saw, original movie. There are tons of original movies, like you said. There are movies that are not just reboots. You, you did what I wanted to do as far as like going through, look at all these, there's, there's two sequels on the board and no remakes from what I see here. Remakes are going to happen. It's a part of it. The same way like comic book movies are a thing now. Now, I also agree with Schnepp here is that sometimes the studio is, f like if they have nothing and they don't have a superhero franchise, they're reaching for stuff. So they go, oh, we need a Pez movie. We need this. We need a People know Pez. Make a Pez movie. So it, it, there comes to be a reaching, but it then maybe the, look, Pirates of the Caribbean is another example that I use. Because when you hear about it, we, if we were doing the show back then, sure. I'm sure you and I would have the conversation they're making a movie off that set it's a ride. ride. It's going a yeah. ride. And they figured a way to do it. Yeah. Now there is a way to do these things to where you can be creative. There's, there's a way to, to but there are there are original ideas inside of that. Even Pirates of the Caribbean, the story was original idea. It was based off this this ride, but it didn't have this full story of Jack Sparrow and everything else. It was an original idea. So there are, like I said, I just think it's a stance sometimes, an admirable stance. But maybe not warning. You just gave me a great idea, Pez. But it's from the future, and all the <laughs> they're like robot dudes, and their heads open up and shoot rockets out of their neck. <laughs> I like it. Now yeah. I will say this though for for these movies like Monopoly and Pez, 
I we recently talked about the Angry Birds trailer that dropped, and to my shock and surprise, I liked it. It was cute, and what that made me think about was. Back in the day, I used to play this first-person shooter called Unreal Tournament. It's still my all-time favorite first-person shooter game. I loved it. But it was the first first-person shooter that I played that introduced me to the concept of skinning. You know, where you could take characters and they'd make the character just look like Homer Simpson. Or you can make the character look like Deadpool and it's running out, so it's skinning it. What the Angry Birds thing did to me it makes me think of skinning. It's like... They did it with the Lego movie, basically. They had this cute idea for a movie with these cute characters, some cute lines, and then they put a Lego skin on it. And then incorporated some very unique Lego stuff to it as well. Right. And I think, you know what? If you come up with a, a neat idea with some cute characters, endearing, stuff like that, but then just slap a Angry Birds skin on it or slap a Pez skin on it or a Monopoly skin on it, there might be potential there, but even though I'm saying that, I still think it's a stupid trend. But we'll <laughs> see how it turns out. Anyway, Mark, how do you see this whole thing? You know, me and my Tea Party friends were at Pebble Beach talking about this, and you guys will buy anything. That's why they keep doing it. it I think the, the studio, it, it can feel like that, too, is that the studios will push these movies, these big franchise tentpole movies, further out from the release date than you will get an indie film. But if you look for them, I promise you, they are there in droves. You just got to go find them. And don't forget, sometimes sequels turn into original ideas. Commando 2 was Die Hard. <laughs> Oh right, yeah. Or also, we like for every Monopoly movie that we might be getting, we'll get Clue, uh, a Clue, which was yeah. actually really fun, and a lot of people love that. And it's like, oh yeah, it's you know, Colonel Mustard in the corner with a wrench, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was in the corner. In the I don't corner. think you could. That, that wasn't a place you could kill somebody in Clue. It was the corner. You had to. Well, had to be a full that's, room. That's where I kill everyone. <laughs> you didn't in play the, the game corner. right. Get over here. <laughs> hey, how come he's not in the corner? Oh, I'm dead. <laughs> I think it was Colonel Mustard in the garage. No, nope, that's not. That's you not also on the table. peed in the house plants. I know. So I, uh, hey, that's how I play. That's how I rock it. <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, listen, and let you guys know, too, our recap network has started up. Who's covering all these types of shows. Empire's up. Yesterday, we put up our first Flash recap show, which is actually the preseason special. And we put up our episode, season three, episode one recap of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. last night. A little bit later today, the Arrow preseason special goes online. Lots of stuff going on. Just look at our YouTube channel. You'll find those shows there. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing right now at our friends at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. Love entertainment news? You got a bookmark collider.com. Be kept up to date with everything going on in the world of entertainment. Steve Frosty, Ryan Traub, and his crack team of writers over there doing an amazing job keeping you fully up to date by the minute on what's going on. Make sure you bookmark collider.com. I want to thank the people sitting at this very full table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. You can find my film tonight at the Music Hall here in Hollywood. I'll be doing a Q&A at the 7 o'clock and 9.45 show. So if you're in Ca California, Los Angeles, come on down to the Lemley's Music Hall and see my Death of Superman Lives, What Happened film. You can also find me in New York next week. We're screening it at the Littlefield Brooklyn Bar and Movie House. 10, 10, 15, write down those dates. Come and have a drink with me in New York. It's part of New York Comic Con, and our movie will be there. Uh, by the way, full marks for... The Megaforce shirt. When, Deeds, not words. Whenever, whenever anybody asks me, what do you want to either see remade or a sequel to that no one's considering, one of the two films I always say, besides Mystery Men, is Megaforce. Man, that's awesome. I want a Megaforce, man. It's it's a poor man's G.I. Joe, man, but I love <laughs> that thing yeah. so much. Barry Boswick. <laughs> Sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? You can find me wearing the best shirt today on Collider <laughs> and uh, online at Twitter and Instagram at 5150 Ellis. And yesterday, you did Heroes. Yeah. Movie Talk. Mm -hmm. You did a special video with you, me, Jeremy Johns, and Chris Gore, which that video will be up online today. Keep your eye open for that. That was a lot of fun. And you did the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. after show last night. You had a busy day. And still managed to fit in the time to acquire a small company and flip it from exorbitant profit. <laughs> <laughs> Over there, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, both Twitter and Instagram, at Christian Harloff. And then we are we're, we're doing Jedi Council on Thursday, normal time where you guys make sure you submit your questions. Hashtag Collider Jedi Council. We'll go through them, and I'm picking questions today. And, of course, our lovely host today, Ms. Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you online? I'm on Twitter and Instagram, at Sinead DeFries, and at that, so Sinead.com. And uh, you can find me on the various social media outlets on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name's John Campia for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>